I thought we would start off first with Murray here. I know a lot of you guys love seeing him so much, so this is Murray. If you're new to my channel, he is just over a year old, and um, he is the light of my life, to be honest. He's very inquisitive and so smart and literally makes me laugh every day. He's also over 30 pounds, so he's kind of heavy and I want to set him down. But I thought we would start the video off with saying hello from Murray. <laughs> okay, so welcome back to my channel. If you hear him playing in the background or you hear a bunch of crazy noise, that's just him. He has his green ducky up here today. So today is more of a casual style video. <laughs> So this has been a long time coming, like over a couple of years, or over a year at least. Um, and it is my Q&A video. Grab a snack or something to drink. I have my coconut mocha here. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you already know I have perfected my coffee. Um, but if you don't follow me on Instagram, you should. We have a lot of fun over there. So yes, I know it has been far too long. Um, since I first said that I was gonna make this video and I have two reasons as to why it has taken me this long first one um, I Actually did film it <laughs> right after I like told everyone I was gonna do it um, It was right before Christmas. I remember not last Christmas, but the Christmas before and <laughs> It literally like I filmed it and I hated it. Like I really hated it. I hated where I was, I hated the lighting. Um, it was just, it wasn't a good video. I was trying to edit it and I got upset and I was like, Billy, I'm gonna do it over. And then life happened, right? Things like the the winter months are my busy time. So it was just, it's, it was something that just kept getting pushed back. But I'm kind of glad we waited because I have a good amount. Now I have all of my questions that I've saved here. And then also I feel like I've learned so much in the year, year and a half or however long it's been. Um, so I feel like I can better answer these questions. I have them in two sections. Um, I have business related questions and then I have like just other questions that, um, just general questions, I guess. So that brings me to the second part as to why I had a hard time filming this. And I know this is gonna make a lot of people upset. I started my YouTube video or my YouTube channel um, a couple of years ago with the mindset of helping people be creative at home. Um, not for people necessarily to start businesses or to like help people build their businesses because I feel like I'm just not a good person for that. Okay, so let's get into the questions. The first question is, do you prep and sell out of your home? If so, how does that work? I do not prep or sell out of my house that is illegal, like I said, in all states. So I work out of a commercial kitchen and I have been doing so for, like I said, over two years now. I honestly love it though anyway. I know that there's cottage food bakers um, who have businesses out of their home. We charcuterie businesses do not fall under cottage food. So if someone tells you they're cottage food and they're selling charcuterie, they're wrong. That's super duper important to me as a business owner to do everything the right way. Um, and I just, I mean, that's, that's my standard. You have to do things the right way. So I definitely recommend going through the proper channels to get legal. Um, next question. I am just starting out. The licensing insurance inside is very intimidating. Are you licensed and insured? If so, how is the process? If not, how important is it starting out? Okay, so yes, I have a license. I have two licenses. Um, and then I am insured. I have to be insured if I work out of a commercial kitchen. Um, and then just for safety reasons for my business. Um, how was the process? The process was rough. So, um, but so worth it in the end. And now it's like smooth sailing. I will say that starting out, it was very intimidating. Um, I called the state weekly. I sent emails daily. It was really hard to get um, an answer back from them about anything, especially when I first started out, charcuterie was so new and nobody knew anything about it. So it was, um, it was kind of, it was like a process, right? 
Um, and then also now I will say, like I have my, my certain inspector that I see, it's still, um, it's still like kind of hard to get a hold of him sometimes, I'm not gonna lie. State employees are underpaid and overworked and they, um, I don't know, I guess <laughs> that's the best way to answer that. All right, if you could list some of your favorite vendor suppliers, preferably online. So when I started my business, um, I used Amazon for a lot of things. Um, I do save some of my favorites into my storefront, so you can always check that out. I like to utilize Amazon as much as I can um, because I have Prime, so then I get free shipping. Did you limit the number of orders per week and the size of boards and boxes when you first started out? So when I first started out, I was working full time at my old job, my last job, and so I did sort of limit. I had really good hours though at my last job. I worked um, 5.30 to two, and so like, after two, I was like free to take any order. I will say that I took a lot. I took everything that came in. I felt like I needed to because I was a growing business, um, which ultimately made my decision to quit my full-time job because I, I wanted all those orders, you know? I wanted to take the 10 a.m. order, but I had a job, you know? So like once my business built up and I was able to like sustain it, I um, did put my notice in at my old job. But I would say if you have a full-time job right now and you wanna make both work, like you have to set times that work for you. Um, because otherwise you're gonna like wear yourself out. I mean, maybe nights and weekends is the only time that you can do boards until you like decide that this is what you really wanna do. And I mean, it's worth it to me. Like the, the weekends are the busiest, right? The second part of the question was, um, did you limit the size of boards and boxes? I did not. Um, Again, like I said earlier, I took everything that came in and because that was my priority. I knew at the end of the day that I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to own a business and I didn't want to um, stay at the treatment center for the rest of my life. So I made that a priority. And I had a really awesome job where it was flexible enough that I could be like, hey, like call my boss, I'm gonna be can I take a half day? Can I, whatever. And she was totally fine with that. Coffee break. <sighs> How to expand your business? How did you grow partnerships, etc.? Social media. Honestly, that is the only thing I can tell you is be personable, put yourself out there, um, show your face, be like, be genuine. People want to support other businesses when they can relate to the person or that they see that the person is a real person, right? Um, that has been the biggest thing for me. I will say I've paid for advertising twice since I started my business and I regretted both times. They did nothing for me. I can sell my business better than anyone who doesn't know anything about my business could sell it. So I would say social media, um, you could do Facebook, like Facebook groups, like foodie groups that are local to you, but focus on people around you, your communities, um, local people, like don't, who cares if you have 10,000 followers that are all over the US? Nobody's gonna buy your stuff. You need 10,000 followers here where you are, right? How to determine the size and amount per person. Um, so I can't even remember how I really figured this out. I think I went on Google and I was like, the average ounce per person for a meal or for an appetizer or whatever, and then just kind of went from there. Um, I will say that I, I love my standard. I definitely feel like I stand out from other businesses around me with the amount that I put on my boards. I always get feedback that people are surprised at how much food was on the board. Um, they always have leftovers, things like that, which maybe is something that I ha will have to reconsider with food prices rising. But um, I pride myself on like 
giving a good amount of food. So I would say, and I know this answer sucks, but this is what I did, like practice. So Google, figure out your measurements, measure, weigh out your food, measure and weigh out your food. Put it on a board and give it to your husband, give it to your boyfriend, give it to your girlfriend, give it to your mom, whoever, and be like, I need feedback. That's literally what I did to my friends and family. I was like, feedback is so important and that's how you learn. How do you source materials and how do you time everything? Well, <laughs> sourcing materials. So I've always loved cheese. I've always loved um, like entertainment type foods, appetizers, small plates, things like that. So I feel like I already had like a good sense of, of what I really liked. Um, but going to a cheese counter, trying everything, um, make friends with the cheese people. That's what I do. Like at my cheese counter, I like talk to them all the time. I like to hear feedback of like what their customers are buying, um, what they're liking, what they're not liking, things like that. How do I time everything? So timing is something that took a long time for me to learn, but I will say the one thing that will help you no matter what is prep. Prep everything you'll only get faster with time when you're building but um i will say now it's been two years over two years since i've started and i finally feel like comfortable without over without giving myself too much time because i feel like i am i'm very like i'll over schedule myself for like something that'll take me 20 minutes um, I might schedule myself an hour because I'm like so paranoid over time. For beginners in the line of work, do you price cheaper until you get more experience? I feel like in other aspects of life, like hairdressers, um, nail techs, things like that, you pay for experience, right? I never thought of that, I guess, like this, but it is true. Like if I look back at my first board, which I don't want to, but I have before and I'm just like, dang, like I sold that for that much when now I, I look at what I'm making and I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. But that's a, that's a really good question. Something I never thought of. Um, but I would say no, I don't think that anyone else in the business does that. But it does make sense like to consider that. So I, I guess it, <laughs> Murray scrounging. Um, but it does make sense to think about that. If you make a board for $20, how much do you charge for it? At least, at the very least, $60. So like, you know the breakdown of the, the price of food, the overhead and the, um, and the labor, right? So you would take the $20 times it by three to cover those three things. But then at the end of the day, you also have to make money. So luxury items have less of a profit margin than if you were to go to McDonald's and get like a hamburger that may cost them like four cents to make. I don't know. I don't know the numbers. I don't eat at McDonald's, but I'm just saying like cheaper things have a higher price. So if you're building an Aldi board and you're charging the same price that I'm charging for high-end ingredients, obviously you're going to make more money, but like at the same time, if I were the consumer, I wouldn't buy the Aldi board. I would buy the high-end board if it were the same price. Does that make sense? So anyway, follow the times three rule and then add some extra onto it. All right, next question. How do you figure your retail price for your boards? I know you said you charge by the ounce. I guess I was just looking for clarification. So like what I just said in the last question, I kind of follow that rule. Um, but then of course, like you said, add more on for your profit. I do weigh out things. So I weigh out the cheese and I weigh out the meat, the two most expensive things on the board. I measure those out by my standard and then I fill in with everything else. You kind of have to set like a budget for your business because um, all cheeses are different price, right? So you might set a budget between so this price and this price and then you, you're kind of safe there, right? So you can pick maybe one day you want this cheese and then the next day you want the other cheese, but you're still like within your budget of spending so that you're not losing profit. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. 
Okay, so I'm editing this and that definitely did not make sense. Basically what I was saying is find a happy medium for cheese prices. So some cheeses are $8.99 a pound. Some cheeses are $40 a pound. So find what fits in your budget. For example, a say anywhere from $8.99 cheeses to maybe a $15 a pound cheese. So those cheeses within that budget are what you're using for your tables, your boards, things like that. So if you maybe one week see a $20 pound cheese that you really, really want to use, then maybe go cheaper that week as well to make up for the difference. I hope, I hope that made sense. I don't charge per ounce. I like weigh things out per ounce. Like that's my business's standard. Um, but basically, oh, and I should have grabbed my, I, I don't have it with me. I think it's at the kitchen, but I have, I like have broken down a few of my boards recently because I wanted to see like if my prices were on point with everything else. And, um, basically you just add up your costs and what everything you have to do with some math. It's a little scary, I know, but you do have to do some math, figure out how much everything costs and then times it by three and then add some extra on. Another question about pricing. Um, how do you price the cones? Again, you guys, this is for absolutely everything that you would have on your menu. You need to break down the price of what it costs you. You can't say it costs $7 to make a cone. You can't charge $7.50. That's not gonna make you any money. That's just the price of the cone, right? Um, you have other things you have to pay for if you're doing this legally, right? Um, so you have to figure out your costs. So for example, if I buy a pack of salami and say it's eight ounces, right? And I paid $5.99, then I would divide $5.99 by eight ounces and then I would know how many ounces or how much it costs per ounce. Does that make sense? Because when I'm opening that pack of salami, I already know I need, so I'll need two ounces of salami and it'll cost so much, right? So that's how you figure out pricing. It's actually a lot easier than people think. It's just more work. And this is something, when it comes to pricing, this is something you learn over time. Like I said, because we're always using different ingredients, different everything's different price it's a lot of work you guys it's a lot of work what is the best way to cost effectively source things that aren't locally available um and that would be wholesale i know you have to pay shipping maybe you have a food wholesaler around you buying in bulk is always the best option but i understand being a small business starting out a 20 pound wheel of cheese isn't necessarily cost effective when you're going, you're not going to use it all, right? Reach out to wholesalers because a lot of people might have like, um, I know m one of my wholesalers, they'll sell chunks of cheese instead of like a whole wheel. So you can buy just like an eight ounce chunk. So doesn't hurt to ask. How do you gauge pricing for charcuterie tables? Um, so that is another <laughs> pricing. It seems to be what you guys are struggling with. And I will say it was the same for me. Um, so how do I gauge pricing for um, grazing tables? So when I price out a grazing table, I have my price similar to what I have my boards listed at. So the, the boards are a little bit more expensive per person if you were to break down the price, um, but they're all very close in price. So. I just do it that way. How do you package your boards typically? So this is something I'm currently working on, but right now I have a few different ways on how I package my boards. So if I have a disposable like palm leaf board that gets cellophane around it, or it gets put into a craft box and then tied. If I have some boards that come with the clear lids, mostly my largest board, um, so that's just a one and done thing. I also have picnic boxes which come, like the food is actually in the craft box, and then you just close the lid, tie it up. <laughs> Packaging has always been something that I've struggled with because 
packaging means everything to me. I am one of those people who appreciates good packaging, and so I want my product to be that way, but I also don't want to like eat up my whole profit or my cost with packaging. So it's something that I'm like working on right now, but those are my like three ways that I do it currently. How do you prep for a busy day or a big order? Can you cut everything days before? So yes, actually, I have a lot of airtight containers and I prep everything typically the day before. So say I have a really busy weekend, Friday, Saturday, not Sunday, I, I don't usually do orders on Sunday, but Friday and Saturday. If, it's, if I don't have time to do it on those days, I always plan ahead with my calendar. I'll go in Thursday and I'll prep what I can. So I'll, I will cut cheeses, um, hard cheeses, typically not soft cheese. And then I will fold salami and I will wash the fruit, except for strawberries. I have like this whole thing, like this whole like, what I what I do do and what I don't do. And it's just, you, you gotta figure it out on your own because what works for me might not work for you. Um, but yeah, I will prep what I need so that, say I have early orders on Friday, then I can go in Friday and just build what I need and everything's still fresh because it's like sealed up really tight. I have airtight um, containers and then I have press and seal. So I will press and seal whatever and then I put it into an airtight container so it's like extra, extra, extra secure and fresh. Um, fruit is something that you can typically wash beforehand. You can wash blueberries, you can wash grapes. I wouldn't recommend blackberries or strawberries. Um, I will, <laughs> this is embarrassing. This is one of my oopsie moments. Um, so I don't think I told you guys, but definitely on Instagram I had mentioned it. Last summer I had an order for Gerard Butler and I was, so freaking nervous about it and I like still like think about it and it gives me anxiety and I absolutely love those boards they turned out amazing um in my opinion but I washed the blackberries the day before because I had to be where he was which was an hour and a half from me I had to be there by 10 a.m so instead of waking up at like whatever time early I like washed the blackberries before and then I went to go build his board and I had all the blackberries that were washed because I use um, like a fruit and vegetable wash that takes off the um, the waxy coating or preservatives or whatever and so they were not black they were like a dark reddish pink like they were going bad so I couldn't add them to his board but I'm just like Sam <laughs> Like you've been doing this too long to mess up like that. So funny story. Anyway, so long story short Yes, you can prep the day before how long do the boards last before serving? Like do you pre-assemble wrap and store for more than a day? Okay, this is another thing that I pride like my business prides itself on is everything is made to order I do not build the board until in a couple hours before their pickup or delivery time so yes, I might slice the cheese, which is totally fine, but I don't build the board until then for a couple reasons. One, I'm super picky about everything I do. Two, I don't like um, the way that either the craft boxes or the palm leaf trays absorb moisture um, because as soon as I pick that up, I can tell that it's old and I don't like that. Like I wouldn't serve that to my customer. And I tell my customers too, I'm like, my boards, my boxes are meant to be eaten the day of, please don't save them. I will accommodate a day and time, like pickup or delivery for you so that you can have your board as fresh as possible. In some cases we have, I have had to make boards for people. Um, I had this one lady who was traveling up north a few hours but then also she was getting there before everyone else for their whatever they were celebrating and so she wanted the board packaged so that it would be safe to consume two days later and so that board I basically I double layered like the bottom and then um of the uh the board itself and then also the parchment paper. I put the cheese, I put the meat, and I put the fruit on. I left the nuts separate because the nuts absorb moisture from the fruit. 
Um, and so I like ha I had that separate and I just told her like what to do with them when she got there. So how do you keep sliced cheese from drying out? Do you put on a wood board for your business or just in a box? Do you let customers keep the wood board if you use one? Um, so uh, first thing, I do have an option on my website if people have want to use wood boards. I have them. They're something that I would that would need to be returned to me. Um, I do have the option of also if a customer wants a wood board to keep, then they'll just pay extra and I'll go buy one or pick one out for them. Do you put on a wood board for your business or just in a box? So I'll do palm leaf usually, um, but like I said, I have the option to upgrade. And then how do you keep sliced cheese from drying out? Um, I don't really have that problem. Temperature control is like a huge thing. If you're leaving it out in the sun, if you're leaving it out more than a food safe length of time, which is four hours, um, that's when it's gonna start drying out. So don't, don't do that. <laughs> also, if, you're, if you put it in the fridge and leave it on like not sealed or anything like that, it'll dry out. So always just make sure that you're covering everything and you're um, paying attention to the times. I have lawn order on in the background. I really hope you guys can't hear that because that would suck. We're like 30 plus minutes into this. Let customers customize their boards. Choice of cheese and meats. Or do you assemble what you typically use and sell as is? Do I let customers customize their boards? To a point, I have options for gluten-free, vegan, vegetarian, things like that. Um, they're all upcharges, but I will do that because it's gonna cost, if it costs me more, it costs them more, right? I don't stick to a set like, oh, I only use this cheese, I only use this type of brie. Um, because the whole reason I started my business was like experimenting and trying all these different ingredients and that's what I wanted to share with my customers. So I might like go to the cheese counter and see like this really awesome goat cheese with like um, spicy hot peppers on it or something and I'm like, oh, that would look so cute on a board so then I'll buy it. But like I said, that's not how you save money for your business. I fully 100% will tell you that is not how you save money, but it is important to me, so I have to make some sacrifices. What do you do for marketing? I market myself with social media. As I mentioned before, I, I paid for a local advertising. It didn't bring me any sales, and I paid for um, The Knot, which is a wedding website, and I, I am 10 months in and I have not got one sale from them, you guys. One, not even one sale, nothing. So I, like I said, I can sell my business better than anyone else can and I'm just gonna stick to it. Like, yeah. Okay, now we have got to the other questions section and we are, this video is gonna be so long. I hope it was worth it for you guys. You really wanted this video. Okay, other questions. I would love to know how you first got into it. Okay, this is a really good question. I get asked this a lot. Before my business, I've always loved, I always love food, as you can tell. I also love gifts, like giving gifts to people. And so my love language is giving gifts. And so like if we combine those two, it kind of makes charcuterie, right? So like when people come over, <laughs> I have a really small family, but I always want like this full spread of like a whole bunch of different foods for them to try. I love like making all of these little like small plates. Like I said, I love like, I'm the type of person that gets really excited when I get to order like five different plates to try like a bunch of different stuff as opposed to one little dinner, right? Um, and so charcuterie just really like fit me as a person <laughs> and like what I love getting along. I told you guys I would have a long answer, but when I was thinking about getting into charcuterie, I made a board. It was not cute. I will, I'll insert it here. But I made a board, I like spent 200 plus dollars and I invited my parents over. So it was me, my husband and my parents. 
and I had them try it and tell me their thoughts and they loved it. My dad is a very meat and potatoes type of guy and he was like excited about all the pairings and like he'd be like oh my gosh you gotta try this cheese with this it's so good and all whatever and I just really loved the feedback and I love seeing how happy people were trying it that I was like this is this is what I'm meant to do <laughs> I love it when I like find something I love like my coffee that I have perfected I've I think I've said it like a thousand times like I would just want to share it with everyone and that's how it was with charcuterie and cheese so how would you style a blue cheese so I think we're getting to the time limit of my camera it might shut off here in a minute but um how would I style a blue cheese so typically I leave blue cheese whole I don't buy crumbled blue cheese um just an FYI if you buy pre-sliced cheeses um shredded cheese anything like that it has a bunch of additives to keep it fresh so I don't do that um, but I'll buy like a chunk of blue cheese and then if I set it on a border table I might take a little knife or fork and kind of break up maybe half of it so that people can see and get the idea like that's you know how you're how you're gonna eat it um, most blue cheese is super crumbly so you can't slice it that is the best way that I would recommend styling it okay I've learned to make the roses with room temperature meat and cheese. After they are created, do you put the tray in the fridge or continue to leave it out? This is a really good example of why I am happy I waited this long to make this video. Um, so when I first started out, I made a video and it's my top watched video on how to fold um, charcuterie like a pro. And in that video, I said to leave meat out so that when it's at room temperature, it's easier to fold, which is so 100% true if you're doing this from your house. And as long as you're sticking within like the timeline that food is safe to be left out. Um, for my business, I don't do that. I um, Everything is a rush for me. So as soon as I take a bag of salami and I open it, the ticker starts. It's good for four hours, right? So I do it as quick as possible to get it back in the fridge so that my customer can enjoy it for the longest amount of time. I hope that makes sense. But when I'm at home, if I'm making a board for myself or my husband or whoever, um, and you're still learning how to like fold salami, if you leave it out for 20 minutes and then you do it, you're, that's fine. Like it really, it's, as long as it's under four hours, that is the length of time that food can be left out. And then after the four hour mark, like don't consume it. Um, so I would always like, so for example, for this question, it says if they're making a salami rose, say they left their salami out for 20 minutes, it's at like that really um, moldable uh, temperature where it can fold easily. And then they like fold it into their rose or their salami river, whatever. Um, I would then put it back in the fridge. But again, that's because I prep everything. If you're gonna put it on the board, that's fine too. But then once the board is done, maybe put it back in the fridge until you're ready to eat it. I would take it out maybe like 20 minutes before so it um, comes back to like a good consistency because when you're eating things cold, you're not getting the full um, the full flavor. So I go go try this. Take a piece of salami, eat it cold, and then have one that's room temperature, and then see if you can tell a different in the a difference in the flavor profile. I bet you can. Hi, I'd love a video on pairings and temperature to serve the meat and cheese. Love your channel. Thank you. Um, that is a really good idea. I used to do a lot of pairings on my Instagram. So like yesterday, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, I like just found the most perfect pairing with what I had and I shared it on my Instagram. It was so good. Um, so I definitely recommend going there and following me and my nonsense. Do you ever include dips on your board? Yes and no. <laughs> so um, dips I'll do, on the average board, I'll do a jam or I'll do a honey. Um, sometimes I'll do, this isn't really a dip, but it's like in a dip jar, right? Um, like an olive tapenade or something like that with olive oil. Um, but when I'm doing specialty boards, like if 
they wanted a crudite board, I would do like a veggie dip, I would do a hummus, and then I might do like um, a balsamic or something. I do love dips. I actually have a grazing table in June that is going to feature a lot of dips and I'm really excited about it. Would it be possible to make a sandwich type charcuterie board? If so, can you show us some time please? Yes. I have made one sandwich style um, charcuterie board and I don't think I have a photo of it though but I basically made like a few different sandwiches and then I included charcuterie and then I included cheese and fruit and everything and it was really cute but I think if you were to get like we should make a video on that that's a that's a good one we should do that we could get like little tiny sandwich buns and then make like two different sandwiches um, and you could have them pre-assembled and displayed on a board or you could have the bread um, and then have everything displayed to make the sandwich. I did this with the grazing table recently. Um, my brunch, I think I have a short on here. If you go back and look at it, it's a brunch style short um, video that I posted and that had like bagels and croissants and everything and everything was deconstructed so that they could add their own cream cheese they could add ham they could add uh, smoked salmon whatever to it so i think that was really fun and i love that because people can make what they want then right we're gonna do that i like that idea plus i really want a sandwich right now that sounds good what is the best way to store cheese for longevity oh a couple things if it is a hard cheese I would vacuum seal it if you can. Saran wrap is kind of taboo in the cheese um, area of life. People, a lot of cheese mong mongers will say saran wrap is fine, especially if you're going to be using it anytime soon. Some people will be like, um, no, that kills the cheese. It cuts off all the oxygen. But for longevity, you definitely have to vacuum seal hard cheeses. When it comes to um, like breeze or goat cheese, you can't vacuum seal that. They're, don't open it until you're ready to use it, basically. Um, people say that you can freeze cheese. I would never do that. Um, like come to a full, complete frozen state because it's gonna change the texture and everything of the cheese and the way it breaks down when it's, um, when it's thawed so don't don't do that if you're gonna put it in the freezer for 15 minutes so that you can cut it nicely that's a different story what was the other thing oh cheese paper so there's wax paper that you can buy um i will link it down below um but there's different like cheese papers those are my favorites because it's sealing the cheese but it's still like able to breathe if that makes any sense um airtight containers things like that but when it's in an air airtight container seven days again seven days that's all you get what cheese do you recommend for someone trying to expand their palate so i guess it really depends on what your palate is so for example i used this before when i explained this if you're a american cheese Velveeta type of gal i might start with an aged cheddar um maybe a sharp cheddar I would stick with a cheddar or a gouda, um, something more palate friendly, um, but it still gives you like a little bit of something, um, like a little bit of texture, a little bit of salt, a little bit of crunch. Um, I like those. If you feel like you're in kind of like the mid range area, I might go for an Alpine style cheese or a cheese that has a natural rind. Um, something that maybe has a little bit of stink on it. I don't know, I feel like people are really scared of those and it's funny to me because I feel like the cheese that might be a little stinky is actually kind of like mild in flavor. But say you like brie, but you wanna try something a little bit different, but maybe not like in a pois, which is like the stinkiest cheese in the whole entire, whole entire world. So we don't wanna go that far, maybe, I would try, there's a company called Jasper Hill, um, and they are out of Vermont, and they have a spruce wrapped brie, and it gets like, it gets moldy, it gets crazy looking, but the inside is just divine. So maybe trying something that not necessarily is like, 
crazy on the palate, but might look a little bit scary, might make you feel more comfortable, I don't know. Also, another suggestion I have if you wanna expand your palette is if you have a higher end grocery store around you or a cheese counter that you can go to, and I'm not just talking like the Walmart cheese selection or Aldi cheese selection, like, like a, a grocery store that gives up samples um, or things like that. Like you can go to any counter and be like, hey, I really wanna try this cheese, but I don't wanna spend you know, $15 on it. Can we try it first? they'll cut it for you. Um, a lot of the grocery stores around me that I go to, they have what they call cheese buckets. And it's just a little bucket full of left, like end, end cuts, weird cuts, weird sizes of cheese that they put in there. So you can get like a little chunk of cheddar or brie or whatever for like a dollar. And that's a really good way to try cheese as well. Best way to package a board for travel. If you say you're, you built this beautiful board and you're going off to your mother's house for Easter, I would say press and seal is your best friend. Um, so for like wood style boards like this, press and seal is amazing. You'll be surprised at how well a board like this will hold up in the car um, because I offer like like a, basically this, but like really long for my customers. And I've delivered to them in our, sorry. And I've delivered them in our Minnesota pothole roads and they've been just fine. Press and seal will be your best friend for life. How do you know how many types of cheese to put on a board? I guess that depends on the size of board. So if I'm doing a small two person board, I like to have different milks. So there's sheep, there's goat and there's cow. And then from there, I like to have a variety of hard, semi-soft or semi-firm and then like a soft cheese um, because you don't want everything to be soft. You're not giving your guests or your customers variety. You definitely want different textures and different milks. How do you suggest serving crackers and or bread? Um, I always serve my crackers or bread on the side. Um, I would do, you could always do two boards. So one board charcuterie, one board for um, crackers or carbs. Or you could do like a little cracker basket. I actually just bought some off of Amazon that are super, super cute. I can't wait to use them. Um, for my custom orders and so then they'll have like a little carb basket um but i always put them on the side if you're gonna eat the board right away putting them on that is just fine otherwise if you're putting it on the board and you're storing it in the fridge over time it's gonna soak up that moisture from the cheese and the fruit and the crackers aren't gonna be crunchy what is the one thing that you should never put on a board This is a controversial question and it's gonna get me in trouble. I do not like a lot of things. I have a lot of opinions on everything in life and peppers are one of them. Um, so if I'm doing a crudite platter, peppers are great, but you will see if you've seen a charcuterie board online, it most likely has a sweet pepper that is cut open with cream cheese or some sort of whatever and then everything but the bagel seasoning on top of it. I just, that's just not my aesthetic, I guess. I don't like that. But some people really freaking love that. I have a friend here, a local charcuterie business to me. She, <laughs> she told me that her customers absolutely love the peppers and she cannot get away from it. Like she said one time she didn't put peppers on a board and they were like, where are the peppers? And she literally made a sh like a box, a, a pastry box full of just peppers. And she said her customers love them, they eat them up. And I'm like, good for you girl, I'm glad, I'm glad you're making money off those peppers. Do you have a must have cheese that needs to be on every board? Yes, I do. I, and <laughs> I know not everyone loves brie, but I love brie. I cannot make a board without brie. If I did, and I have before, I just look at it and it feels like it's incomplete. Like, <laughs> I don't know what it is. And what's nice about brie is there's a goat brie, um, there's a three milk brie, so you can definitely get a good variety. It's not all just cow's milk, 
but I just I love Brie and I feel like everyone else in the world loves Brie, which I know is not the case. I also always put either a jam or a honey unless it's requested not to because I feel like it adds the perfect amount of sweetness to some of these cheeses. A lot of people don't know. They'll be like, oh, why is there a honey on here? Well, you have Manchego on your board and Manchego is chef's kiss with honey. What is the difference between a cheese board, a grazing board, and a charcuterie board? This is a great question. Thank you so much for this one. I love this one. Well, let's start with charcuterie board. A charcuterie board is a display that includes meat. So charcuterie. Charcuterie is cured meats. Salamis, prosciuttos, soppressatas, things like that. If it has that on there, it can be classified as a charcuterie board. Um, a grazing board kind of encompasses all of it. So it could be a charcuterie board, it could be just a cheese board, it could be a crudite board. It's basically just a board of food that you are grazing on. Um, so you might see dessert boards or things like that and people, people sometimes will call them like a dessert charcuterie board. And I, I understand that people don't realize that charcuterie is just cured meats and like they think of all displayed food like that as a charcuterie. So like I get it and I'm not gonna correct people, but I would just call it a dessert board or a dessert grazing board. Um, a cheese board would just be like, I mean, I even call charcuterie boards with like the meat cheese and the standard, I, I call those cheese boards too. So, because it has cheese on it, so it can be a cheese board. But if there's no meat on it, technically it's not a charcuterie board. I All right, we are on the last question. What is your least favorite cheese? So for me personally, when I'm consuming cheese, my least favorite is goat cheese. I will, I try every goat cheese, but I will never grab for it if I'm consuming a cheese board. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like the tanginess of it. I think there's maybe been two instances in life where I've actually enjoyed it, but it was more so on a meal, not on like a, sh a cheese board, charcuterie board situation. Um, so I do not like goat cheese. My least favorite cheese to use that is requested is anything that's like highly processed. Um, I, I definitely prefer like artisanal cheeses, artisan cheeses on my boards. Um, so I'm trying to think what the weirdest cheese is that I have had that's been pimento cheese. And I know <laughs> that's like a huge thing people love, but I did have somebody request pimento cheese and I feel like that's just like cream cheese mixed with shredded cheese mixed with like pimentos. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you guys for sticking around through that long q and A. I I know you guys were looking forward to it for a long time. So Murray just wanted, he just woke up. He was sleeping that whole time being such a good boy. Um, but anyway, I hope you guys have a good one and I will talk to you very soon. Bye.